Okay, we are live streaming into the face or YouTube. I'm dropping the link in the Facebook group. We got a lot of moving parts here, but I love it. Okay. All right, we're live on YouTube. Fall landing strategies with Steven Kenny. Okay. All right. That's post in the Facebook group. They will chime in. I'll be watching the comments over there as well. I'm going to hit record on my computer. All right, y'all. Welcome to the MMOA podcast, Modern Management of the Older Adult. We're doing a special interview today. I have with me Stephen Kenny. Stephen Kenny, for context. So we were doing uh, a revamp of Modern Management of the Older Adult Live. And we have a section called Falls Prevention. And, you know, Falls Prevention, big term in geriatrics and something that we love to speak to and, and try and speak to the assessment piece and the intervention piece. But the more you dive into the literature, the more you realize that we may only be really focusing on one half of that equation. We focus on a lot of the things that happen before a fall or the factors that could contribute to a fall. But we do a miserable job at addressing some of the factors that may happen after someone loses their balance in terms of their reaction strategies, in terms of their ability to safely land and reduce the risk of, in of, of injury or help them be able to get up from the ground after the event of a potential fall. And so we started to talk about this concept of falls preparedness and diving into that literature, Stephen Kenny's name kept, came up uh, immediately in terms of a really interesting case study where he talked through some different strategies of teaching a patient how to fall. And from that point on, that just kind of led into another black hole of looking at all of Stephen's references and seeing, oh, this cool interview or article, this one, this one, this one, and then reached out to Stephen and just want to thank him for his work. And then uh, we, if you've been to MMA Live, we reference that case study a bunch. And you've probably seen Stephen demonstrate some of these videos as well. So that's why we're here. Stephen Kenny, welcome to the podcast. Good to have you on. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, excited to, to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So just for a little context of your, your background, because your bio is really impressive. You've got experience in a lot of different settings. You've, you've done research on different things as well. Let, well, I want to stick to this, the fall landing strategies for, for this conversation. What, what was the origin of you starting to become interested in, in learning how to fall well, but then also teaching other people how to fall, specifically in the context of rehab? Kind of talk us through, through that trajectory. Uh, so when I was in PT school, one of the things that I uh, started doing was uh, – actually was doing martial arts for the first time ever in my life. And it was really interesting experience. Um, and I also thought it was kind of cool to learn just another, another way of moving as I was kind of going through PT school and getting some practical knowledge that way. I really didn't think it would kind of lead into this, but um, I had a patient uh, when I was at the end of my DPT program, when I was working in the clinic and thank, thank goodness I had a really cool CI uh, she was, this was in an inpatient rehab setting. She was really afraid of falling. Um, the patient is afraid of going home by herself. And so I kind of thought about it. I was like, oh, well, I know all these like fall techniques that we do in martial arts. And I know like, especially in the class after me, there was a woman who was uh, in her, I think her early eighties, who was in a, a judo class. Hmm. And I was like, okay, well, no, why don't I try and use some of these different strategies and implement it in clinic and kind of make her feel a little bit more, uh, what's it called, safe going home. So I started using it then. Um, and I kind of went away from it for a little bit early in my career, but I started kind of in integrating it back again. And I started using it more and more and looking at the research and I think it really seemed like a growth opportunity for our patients and things that you're talking about that we can help prepare people for falls. And because we can't reduce the risk of falls to zero, though we can prepare people for when that fall does happen, because there's at some point falls are going to happen no matter how, what grade of intervention we did, whether it's uh, like fantastic balance training or gait training or something like that, or even strengthening. So we need to kind of be prepared for that. And that's kind of how this all um, kind of started for me and has continued to go. Yeah. 
and, and that you bring up a good point about you know we we probably can't reduce that risk to zero percent of falling right and it, it makes me think about my own life of i fall i have i've had lots of falls within the past couple of weeks you know whether it's tripping on a child a toy missing a step whatever uh, yeah, they probably I could have reduced my risk to some degree, but when when I think about this concept, like my bias definitely leans towards how how can older adults use this? How can the people that I serve use this? But in reality, this is not an, a geriatric topic, right? Like this is something that we we all want to be equipped with. So so hopefully the listeners, regardless of your age, hopefully you're thinking, huh? Do I know how to fall? Can I? fall well without, you know, getting an injury or reducing risk. So this is very pertinent stuff. So you mentioned the research of, of fall landing strategies. If you were to kind of give a 30,000 foot view of what the research is showing, what would you say to someone that may not be used to this topic? Is it, is it beneficial for folks? Uh, is it trainable? Like, will people be able to use these strategies when they do lose their balance? Kind of what are the themes that you're seeing uh, from the research side of things? So yes to all those things. Uh, and you even talk about uh, safe all landing strategies being a lifespan intervention. And I think the research actually supports that as well because there is a, they've looked at safe all landing strategies for individuals who are elite rugby players and uh, doing training sessions on teaching them how to fall significantly reduced the risk of injuries, uh, which is a big deal in that population. You'd think an elite athlete wouldn't necessarily get a benefit from this, but it does, but they do. Um, and I think that's really important research and even younger kids, there's some research saying that maybe the training wouldn't have an effect, but if you look at some of the different subgroup analysis for children who are a little bit less active, um, there's some significant findings that it can reduce injury for kids who are less active. So there mm -hmm. can be, um, we say it's not a geriatric thing, and it's really not if you look at the research. It goes from, uh, from younger, uh, younger individuals all the way to, our, uh, to older individuals. And within that geriatric population, which I'm assuming a lot of people are here for, uh, to talk about that, mm -hmm. There is research indicating, yes, it is trainable, uh, and yes, that it, uh, it can have effects like reducing the risk of falls, improving balance, improving uh, balance confidence, reducing fear of falling. And yeah, we need more high-quality research trials, but I think what we have right now is definitely we see already positive outcomes. Um, and at the very least, it is a very, it is a safe and feasible intervention because there's even been research studies done with individuals with osteoporosis and mm. individuals post-stroke. So there's a lot of good stuff out there on this. Yeah. And the safe part, I mean, I think for most clinicians, they, they think about that immediately. When you hear training people how to fall and we think about so many scenarios that, that we work with and diagnoses where it could lend itself to some repercussions, if you will, but to show that they're safe, that's that's pretty huge. So for for those that may hear the term fall landing strategies and think they're still not able to conceptualize like what that actually looks like or what that means, what would be your your definition uh, for that for folks that are not familiar with this whatsoever? Um, so I'm roughly paraphrasing from uh, there's a moon article. It's a it's a review that kind of shows the pros and cons of different strategies that people use to fall and which strategies reduce uh, impact forces and also velocity, uh, impact velocity. So uh, basically what that was saying is these are strategies that are you train someone to do that should um, reduce the risk of harm that results from falls. And so when we're doing safe fall landing strategies, it's, it's training people how to fall is, is kind of the simplest way. Okay. Um, and I think that is, that's kind of how I, how I view that. Yeah. Awesome. So I want to dive into some, some of the practical tips for, especially for folks that are listening of, of what this can look like clinically. So I want you to go back, think about maybe one of the first times that you implemented this in practice. You may, you know, had that particular patient that you're thinking about. What, what mistakes did you make early on that you learned tremendously from when you were starting to teach people how to fall? Uh, I think one of the major ones is we underestimate a lot of people sometimes. Mm. And 
we're like, well, you know, I don't know if this person can do a, a full standing fall because they're old. And I mean, we need to know that that's, we have to stop kind of judging people just on based on age alone. And mm-hmm. you'll be surprised how far in some of the progressions that people can get. Um, another big thing that I would also uh, kind of strike home with people, one of the things, especially when doing the posterior falls, mm-hmm. is always make sure you're guarding people's head. Um, I do also work with a lot of individuals with concussion. And you're like, oh, man, this like 13-year-old kid's going to be fine doing just a seated posterior fall. Um, but a lot of times those individuals will have uh, upper cervical spine uh, motor control deficits, and mm. that can be very difficult for them to control that. And there's been a surprising number of times where I have that, my hand is back there guarding the head and they lose control when doing a posterior fall and I'm there to guard them and protect them and keep them safe. So anytime if, when we do this clinically, we really should try and be guarding mm. uh, the individuals who we're seeing young, old. Um, high level, low level, whatever you say, just as kind of uh, as a safety thing to do. Yeah, the the from my limited experience, the guarding has been challenging, especially with that that posterior roll. And for for folks that that may not picture this, think you're falling backwards. You may try and get your butt to the ground relatively soon. You're rolling on your back, and if you're not able to kind of protect your head, tuck your chin, you know, you're just going to hit your head right on on the ground or whatever surface. So having a hand as a clinician, having a hand behind them to guard. And I've noticed that if people if people don't tuck quickly in terms of their chin before they kind of build up that centripetal force, that's really tough to protect your head once it's already in that motion. And then while you're down there, and Julie Brower, she teaches with MOA and she, this has happened to her. There's a funny video clip that we have where she's so focused on the head that she forgets where the feet are going to where she almost gets clocked, <laughs> kicked right in the head because she's not uh, paying attention to where the, where the feet are. So the guarding is, can be really challenging. Um, when, when you were starting, what was your setup? Like what mats did you have? Did you go to grass? Like what, what was the setup like? So when I first started, uh, it would be more, I would have people kind of seated on uh, like kind of a large high low mat. Mm -hmm. And I would, uh, I I started from there. And then I would also do kind of the anterior block falls from uh, typically like a quadruped position or a kneeling position, uh, depending on the ability of the patient. I, a little bit later on, I started adding, uh, there's a study by Arnold where they actually do the anterior block fall progression in a different way where they start rather than like in tall kneeling or quadruped, you start in standing, like doing it against the wall and then Uh, you do it against the counter and then you get progressively lower. So there's kind of two different ways to do that progression, which I like because sometimes that standing progression, people tolerate that a little bit better. mm -hmm. Um, So I think that can be, that's a good alternate strategy for people to use. That's interesting. And that's much less intimidating. I could see for folks a little more in control. So, so in terms of, so you have the, the hollow tables and a convenient tape or wall um, and any other things that you think folks should have, if they're going to try, try this I stuff in think, the clinic. I think a bonus thing to have would be a mat. And I've had to work in a lot of clinics where I don't necessarily have like a floor mat, because in order for you to do, if you're going to try and do uh, kind of sideways falls, you're really going to need, you need a lot of space with that. And Mm -hmm. you really need to have a mat on the ground. It's, it's very hard to do. Even if you have a very big high low table, I really don't love the idea of doing it up there because you have to kind of take up so much real estate and you're on an mm-hmm. elevated surface. So that would be a, a really nice thing to do. But if you do, not every clinic has a lot of open space to put a mat down. And I think you can do it without you're going to be limited in the interventions that you can provide. Yeah. Do you have a preference in, in mats? Cause we, in, in MOA live, we'll, we'll do a, a lab, you know, about an hour and a half long where we'll do some different strategies and, We've had mats, you know, kind of the old school, relatively thin kind of truffle gym mats. We've had a uh, bouldering mats like the rock climbers would take out to boulder. Um, do you have any preference one better than the other? What's your, what's your take on that? I think, uh, I think either of those could be options. I, we just have to work with what we got sometimes and depending on the 
it, that, for that one, it's hard to necessarily get people from a standing position, as many people from a standing position uh, doing a, doing a lateral fall. Mm-hmm. So I think either of those could work. I really would caution people against using like a yoga mat. Cause generally speaking, yeah. a yoga mat's not going to have enough padding for most people. Uh, so I, I think that's probably the one thing I would, I would avoid with people is re- mm. I would say those kind of the, the trifold mats is okay. But if you use, have a softer surface, even better. Um, and that might allow you to be able to do more of these interventions with, uh, people who would otherwise not be able to do it. So it just, it gives you more options and possibilities. Yeah, that's a good point. I think folks that are in clinics, you may have some options. Um, a lot of CrossFit boxes as well, they'll have, um, not all of them, but a good bit will have these really, they're about, I would say about five to six feet tall and big rolls that will just roll out. And they're usually a couple of inches thick that they'll use for different gymnastic stuff and handstand stuff and handstand pushups and whatnot. And that can be, that can be a good pad as well. Um, for table use, and I've learned this the hard way, uh, especially with some of those high-low tables, especially the big mat tables, check underneath, folks, because if you have a, you may have a relatively cheap table that's made of this MDF uh, board, and you may have, you know, maybe a two-by-four support all, all the way around, or maybe even a smaller support, and the support down the middle may not be enough to withstand someone falling on it. So we've we've seen a lot of really sturdy tables uh, that have good support. So we'll have kind of a cross member, another two by four kind of drilled in and seen a lot that are just big open space, nothing but MDF board underneath it. It's relatively easy to split uh, when you, especially if you're doing like a full standing fall or something along those lines. So the the equipment is huge. I was also going to say, um, if you're using a high low table with a, that has a head to it, where the head can go up and down, put the head down. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to do, it sounds obvious, but, uh, mm. sometimes it's not obvious to some people. So I would definitely recommend doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for folks that are, are listening or thinking, what, what are these guys talking about? What, what does this look like? Make sure you check the link in, in the, in the show notes, because I'll send you It'll send you to, to Stephen's case study that has all kinds of videos demonstrating how you would progress and how you would scale these different, different movements. <clears throat> awesome. Well, I, we had a few MMOA member questions um, that I think a lot of us have uh, when we go to apply some of this stuff. So I'd love to run through that and just get your thoughts on it. Mm-hmm. The first one, I think this is a big one for, for a lot of folks. Uh, Anna said, would you teach fall landing strategies to all your patients? AKA, and this is this is something I think about a lot, like who are these strategies good for in the context of a busy outpatient clinic where someone comes to you for low back pain, for example, just thinking about some of these different scenarios where people have limited time, folks may have come to them for different reasons other than learning how to fall. That's usually not a primary driver in mm-hmm. PT. Um, how, how do you think about implementing these strategies in those, those types of situations? So I think it can be incorporated for, um, even because some of the cases you just described right there, that individual who has low back pain, uh, a lot of, a lot of those individuals will have benefit from different motor control activities, or even if you're past that kind of pain modulation stage and you're ready to do a lot more, uh, appropriate loading with that individual, you could use this as a different type of, uh, motor control intervention or strengthening strategy for them doing that. I really also, I kind of talked about a little bit before, but for those individuals with cervical motor control, Mm -hmm. rather than just doing um, like you get that progression of like the posterior leans where you're trying to work on that deep neck uh, and flexor uh, musculature, you can also uh, go into a posterior uh, fall with that. Mm. Uh, for vestibular patients, a lot of times if they're, we're doing habituation type exercises, or we want to make sure that the symptoms are going to, uh, remain where they are. I do this as a kind of a challenge to make them feel more confident and more stable with where they're at with their symptoms. Cause they're like, I don't know if, if this is going to come back. What if I turn the wrong way and you have them do a, like a full standing CD, a, a full standing posterior fall, they're going to feel good about it. Mm -hmm. specifically, I think the question is probably looking a little bit more for indications for a geriatric population. And 
I think you can do this with the majority, um, potentially all of your patients too. If you kind of think about safe fall landing as a spectrum of interventions, you don't need to go through the whole progression with everyone. You can stop wherever you want. Mm. And it could be as simple as doing a rapid stepping strategy. I think it, I, I consider that a safe fall landing strategy as yeah. well as, uh, if you're, uh, like another, like could be like a wall push up or even uh, a ball toss, a quick ball toss to work on reaction time. Yeah. If you could do that, probably with a lot of your adults who you, you think are at risk of falling, that could be an appropriate intervention. So I do think it works for a lot of different people. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Of of when when you when you're saying falling strategy, that is not falling from standing. It's it's so modifiable we can adjust the range of motion to to almost anybody so that was really helpful i think a lot of folks that that's the biggest concern and that i think that will give a lot of folks confidence to try some variation and when for once again check out that article if you want ideas because i know it can be difficult to conceptualize while we're we're talking about it <clears throat> jeff musgrave he teaches with moa he said research-based landing strategies for falling from chair height i think it's a really good question of are are there different methods when, you know, we're not full standing where we're at chair height, maybe trying to do some type of transfer? Um, are there strategies to help in those scenarios? Yes. Uh, and I think there's also a good point in time too, because it depends on the type of chair that you're in, the false, yeah. uh, safe fall strategy you would use. And it also depends on the individual um, who's in front of you. So if you look um, and just like a little bit of a detour with this too. So a lot of the research has shown, uh, like especially in that Moon article, that doing a martial arts arm slap on the ground doesn't necessarily um, help individuals in terms of reducing uh, forces when they impact the ground. Hmm. So generally speaking, that's not something you're going to need to train for most falls. However, something like that, there are exceptions where it might be useful. Like if you're rolling close to a street and that arm slap stops that fall and prevents you from rolling into a roadway. So mm. I think that's, even though there's evidence that that might not really be a huge benefit for people, there might be a certain circumstance where one fall is superior to another, even though it would be considered unoptimal cons uh, compared to the rest of the research. Mm -hmm. So the reason why that's important for this case is if you have someone who's very mobile in a wheelchair that you're, it's very easy to do like a wheelie on, you actually need to be worried about the cervical control to uh, for a posterior fall compared to an uh, individual who's in a very stable wheelchair where you really can't do a wheelie. And then uh, maybe you're going to work more on kind of those anterior falls for that individual. I would say... What's most important if they're doing an anterior fall, um, you really want to try and make sure they land kind of with uh, with a bent elbow position. That mm -hmm. would be that would be important, uh, especially if you can, if the circumstances allow it, is to kind of fall right along the surface of kind of those forearms, like kind of in uh, to increase and dissipate the forces over that whole surface area. Um, there might be a scenario where that might be a little bit different. Like if you're on uneven terrain, um, like I run a lot. And if I have a fall interior fall, I really don't want to land like this because if there's roots and I land on a root, mm. that's going to be all the force kind of going to one part of my forearm. So then the hands are actually a better way to fall on that, even though it would put me at an increased risk for um, falling an outstretched uh, hand type injury. Mm. So there are different variations, but I, I would really start with like the bent elbow and your fall. If this is a traditional wheel, wheelchair that I'm thinking of. Yeah. With your running example of going with your hands and not necessarily your forearms, are you still quickly, <clears throat> you know, flexing, bending the elbows, allowing your arms to kind of take that force, even if your hands are hitting first? I think that there's probably, there's some degree of flexion in my arms and doing it. it's not like i'm locked out straight like okay. that um because I, I think it's i'm controlling descent to the ground typically yeah. more often than that that's good I, I think when you describe like some of the different scenarios of a chair height fall there there are some principles that the you you teach someone standing from full standing too which is cool to think about how these things translate well, what I'm curious about, and I love your thoughts, is if if you teach someone how to fall in some of these shorter ranges of motion, so let's say when they're going from 
uh, tall kneeling to, to quad, tall kneeling to prone, some of those strategies in kind of that graded manner, will that translate to a, a full standing fall if they if that occurs? Or take the backwards, for example, of working on, you know, being able to tuck their chin, control their head and cervical spine when they're seated rolling backwards in that, con- that uh, lower range of motion, will that translate to if they fall backwards in, in full standing? That's a big question I have. I don't know if you've <clears throat> studied that much or thought about it. Yeah, I think the answer is is a hard maybe on that uh, mm-hmm. because if you look at some of the work that uh, has been done with the Namigan Fall Program, which is, uh, this is a group in the Netherlands that have looked a lot on, um, it's a multimodal program, but it does include safe fall landing strategies. Mm-hmm. There is some evidence that it reduces, that there's uh, reduced the, the risk of falls, um, and I know some of the groups did, a, uh, did the modified falls and still found it to have uh, some benefit because they didn't necessarily go through the full progression. Uh, and additionally, there's like I remember, I, there's a couple of the studies, the, the serious injuries that were sustained by the falls tended to be less in the experimental group or the ones that did the safe fall landing strategies and more in the, uh, in the kind of control groups. But it wasn't at a level to get reach statistical, statistical significance because they're such small occurrences. The study is underpowered to be able to detect that. So I know the mm. the one study with osteoporosis, I think there were four severe injuries to one severe injury um, when they did safe fall landing strategies for those with osteoporosis. So it's I'm hopeful that it could and. Um, we 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 really do need re- further research to definitely confirm that, but mm-hmm. I do think it's possible uh, to get that benefit. And even if you do not get that benefit, if we can't be a hundred percent sure on that, don't say we don't get that. There's still benefits. It could be for fear of falling, mm-hmm. for bone mineral density, um, for balance confidence. So we hope that we get that benefit. But if we don't, we're still getting some other good benefits too. Right, right. You're going to benefit some some type of outcome. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Julia Brower asks, sideways falling, how do you train that technique? In, in your case study, if I recall, uh, there is a quad side roll progression. Um, mm-hmm. I don't remember if, there, if, if you showed a full standing side fall in that or not, but could you kind of speak to what a progression may look like when you're teaching someone how to fall to their side? So um, it's starting quadruped, generally speaking. And I kind of think about it that you're uh, tucking your chin to the opposite leg that you're falling of the side of the opposite side you're falling to. So if I'm falling to my right side, I'm tucking my chin to the the left side in that position. And I'll kind of go through that pre-falling motion it's almost in some type of ways, it's, it's kind of, uh, a little bit like a, like almost a a weird bird dog where you're kind of curling up rather than kind of extending. Uh, and then from there I'll go into the actual side fall. And the key is really with this, it's guarding the head and facilitating that neck head motion. Because, uh, if you remember from PT school, the head hit head hips relationship Mm -hmm. when working with individual spinal cord injury, if your head moves a certain way, the, the pelvis is going to go that opposite direction. Mm-hmm. So I kind of really leverage that there. And it's not like just slamming someone's head down. It's almost like kind of like a traction or arch, arching uh, force. It's a little hard to show um, without actual, uh, without like seeing a video of it, but I, that's how I kind of progress that. Then I'll go into half kneeling. Then you can go into kind of a split stance and standing. Then you can do it in standing. So I think those okay. are the benefits of that doing a pure lateral fall, it's always, it's probably a little bit better for most individuals to be a little anterior, a little bit posterior. If you do straight lateral, mm-hmm. you're probably, a, you, you really are going to increase the uh, hip index forces, which maybe you want to do, but a lot of times you kind of want to avoid, especially with our um, geriatric populations. Yeah. What, what are you thinking about with your arms in those scenarios? In what terms are you of that- with them? So yeah, uh, your upper extremities, uh, the way I would kind of say that is where your eyes are looking. So if you're, again, you're doing that chin tuck to that opposite foot, almost, you almost be reaching that, um, that arm to that foot as well. Okay. 
So, right. the, so it's the really right arm would role. be going to left foot. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And I think, and that's why I started that way. Cause I think going pure lateral for people is hard. Cause if you go pure lateral, you really have to make like almost like a, a C with your body and go into a side bend. Mm. Um, and it's, it's tricky for people to learn without, uh, what's called hitting their hips a couple times. It's possible. Um, but I think you really need to progress into that and have the right patient for that. Yeah. 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 I'll have to try that one out. I haven't played around much with that one personally. And that's one thing I would say to everybody, do this yourself before you try and teach it to someone else as with most things in life, but try these out, try these progressions out, watch these videos. Um, especially if, if you're having a hard time picturing what, what these can look like doing them yourself can be really helpful. So I know I'm going to, I need to try that sideways fall. Um, because I, yeah, I've been kind of intimidated to do that. Um, so, so far. So I'm going to add that one to my list. If you do, if you work on the straight sideways, the way I would say is to do that is go start on your knees and kind of like, um, not a full tall kneel position, but kind of like squatted back a little bit, Mm -hmm. kind of go there and just really try and work on making a C with that side that's falling, then go into tall kneel and try doing to do that. Um, the next progression is standing. You're going to go into the deepest squat that you can, and then try and kind of do that again, trying to keep that C as you're doing that. Okay. Awesome. And what can help out with that too, is if you kick out, um, your leg. So as you're, as you're dropping into that deep squat, if you kick out your, the leg of the side you're falling to, that might make it a little bit easier for you to do it as well. Okay. Awesome. Well, I want to make sure everyone's aware of, of a cool learning opportunity uh, because this, this topic is fascinating to me. I know it's fascinating for a lot of the listeners and you're doing a pre-con at CSM uh, this year. Could you share more information on that? Uh, what people should expect, how they can sign up? Yeah. So um, we're, we're, we're ex- uh, excited that we are accepted by the geriatric Academy to do a pre-conference course there. So it's going to mm-hmm. be an eight hour course uh, it's going to be very interactive in terms of labs, uh, also discussions as well, too, because I know there's a lot of people, uh, questions that people have and kind mm-hmm. of trying to figure out how it fits into your caseload. So there are going to be a lot of like case studies and practical applications where we can work in how we're going to make this work for you. So when you go back to clinic on Monday morning that you can apply all of this. So uh, we're really excited about that. We're going to go through a lot of the falls that we kind of show in that uh, PTJ article, but the, mm-hmm. the rationales behind the contraindications really build off the conversation. And I know a lot of people want to see the research on this because they're mm-hmm. still a little iffy on it. And even if you show them the like one or two pieces of the research, you're like, ah, I still want more. And there's, there's a fair amount of research in there that we didn't even cover today in terms of the benefits of this. So um, this is going to be uh, this is going to be February 22nd uh, at uh, APT Combined Sections meeting. I believe that's uh, Wednesday. So uh, if you can uh, you can sign up at the uh, APTA uh, CSM website. Mm-hmm. There's more information on there. Well, and I know uh, I shared the links with you as well. So hopefully yep. you have access to that. Yeah, we'll put those links in the in the show notes for sure. Well, awesome. Yeah, that's going to be one heck of a time. I cannot wait to see the videos from this <laughs> a room full of people falling in a controlled manner to the ground is going to be awesome. Uh, if folks have uh, questions for you, want to reach out, is there a preferred social media channel uh, that you want people to, to look at? Um, I probably am a little bit more responsive uh, to Twitter, uh, okay. the, uh, but Instagram, I'm also, I have, uh, uh, you can reach me there too. So an Instagram, I'm, uh, uh, Stephen Kinney PT, uh, mm-hmm. and on Twitter, I'm, uh, Stephen underscore Kinney PT. So, uh, okay. I'm generally pretty responsive to that. I'm, it might not be like right in that moment, but, um, I'll definitely try and respond to anyone yeah. who has questions. People can wait. They can wait. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, and for, for folks listening, that's S T E V E N K I N N E Y PT. That's his Instagram handle there. Awesome. Well, thank you for chatting. This is super helpful. Uh, everyone links to the articles are going to be in the show notes, the pre-con, uh, Steven social media <clears throat> accounts as well. Be sure to reach out to him, check out that PTJ case study, really helpful read and really good videos. Um, but thanks, man. Thanks for putting this information out here. It's needed. Uh, <clears throat> this is a conversation that 
we've been neglecting for such a long time addressing only half of the falls issue. Uh, love, love what you're doing and, and just want to support you whatever we can. So appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you and all the work that you're doing to translate this knowledge. And you're, I love the stuff you do in terms of appropriate loading. So thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Okay. So we're still streaming on YouTube. Um, so what I'm going to do, thanks for, for the YouTubers that are watching right now. We've had about eight or nine folks watching live uh, the whole time, which is cool. So I'm going to take the audio. I'll put it up on on the podcast um, that will probably air either this Thursday or next Thursday, depending on if I'm able to do that relatively quickly. And I'll tag you on all that stuff on Instagram, on Twitter um, as well. I got all the links and that's it. Let me know if you have any other questions. Just feel free to shoot me an email. Yeah. Sounds good. Are you going to be at CSM this year? I won't be. Ah, okay. No, no. Yeah. We're missing out. So San Diego is going to be awesome though. I'm hoping so. So, yeah. okay. Well, maybe I'll see you around at some other point in time then. Yeah. At some point, at some point. All right. You have a good pay.